Minutes from landing, pilot Bob Fox spots a distant plane. There's one underneath. I was looking at that inbound over there. A professional photographer happens to spot Flight 182 in flames. London's Heathrow Airport. Be like 548 requesting start. The crew of British European Airways Flight 548 is completing final preparations for an afternoon flight to Brussels. Captain Stanley Key was supposed to have today off, but was called in at the last minute. Key is a former Royal Air Force pilot and one of the airline's most qualified captains. Start a master. On. It takes three pilots to fly the plane. Troops down. Jeremy Keeley is the co-pilot. Flaps 20. Simon Ticehurst will help monitor the instruments. Engine one start. Engine one start. B line five four eight clear for takeoff. Five four eight. The captain calls for takeoff power. Maximum thrust. Second officer Tyshurst monitors the plane's speed. 100 knots. They can't lift off until they reach rotation speed, 139 knots. Stopwatch on. Rotate. The carriage up. Sixty seconds. As the plane climbs, passengers are rocked by turbulence. E line five four eight climbing has cleared. Five four eight airborne at zero nine. Good day. Roger. Keeley prepares to throttle back the engines. If he does it too soon, the plane won't have enough power to climb. 75 seconds. He'll have just five seconds to get it right. 85 seconds. 90 seconds. Keeley reduces power just in time. Passing 1,500 feet. The procedure goes well. 548, climb to flight level 60. Squawk 6615. The tower clears them to a higher altitude. Up to 60. Then. What was that? The plane begins to lose altitude. December 28th, 1978. We're losing an engine. United Airlines Flight 173 is less than 22 miles from Portland International Airport. The plane's engines are flaming out one after another. With two engines gone, the autopilot can no longer fly the plane. McGrew must get the crippled DC-8 to the airport himself. The engineer struggles to keep the last two engines running. 
just lost one and two. Flight 173 has now lost all four engines. With no engines running, backup batteries now provide power to only critical instruments. The 100-ton aircraft is losing more than 3,000 feet of altitude a minute. At this rate, they will be lucky to stay airborne for as long as 90 seconds. Now, Captain McBroom makes a horrifying calculation. I can't make it. The airport is too far away. Okay, declare a mayday. Portland Tower, United 173, heavy mayday. He was declared mayday, and then in a very, what seemed to me like a, a calm, matter-of-fact voice, I could hear the pilot. The engines are flaming out, we're going down. We're not gonna be able to make it to the airport. We lost power, we're going down. Emergency services are told what's happening. Flight 173 is flamed out. They're going down. The DC-8 is coming down over a densely populated suburb. Suddenly, Captain McBroom sees what he's been looking for. A dark area up ahead. It looks like an empty field. The place that you want to put it is where there, there's minimum buildings, uh, the most open area possible, because the 200,000 pounds plus jet arriving at 140 knots, which is 160 plus miles an hour, it's going to do a lot of damage to the things on the ground. Putting the plane on this narrow strip of land is McBroom's best bet. But as he gets closer, he realizes it isn't an open field. We can't make it. It's a heavily wooded suburb, and he's headed straight for it. If they're woods and that's all you have, then you're going to have to deal with it. The tops of trees are pretty soft. As you settle into the trees, they get progressively less soft. They're going to do a lot of damage. McBroom doesn't give up. He actually tries to steer the plane between the trees. Passengers still assume that they're about to touch down on a runway. We clipped the top of a few trees, and that felt like we were making the initial landing at the airport. So my first sense was, you know, hooray, we're there. And then all hell broke loose. I saw the bright flash out there and, uh, and knew he had gone down. The plane carves a 1,600-foot-long path through the trees. Incredibly, the DC-8 has crash-landed in the middle of a major American city without injuring a single person on the ground. Most of the 189 passengers and crew are alive, including Captain Albert McBroom. Los Angeles International Airport. Hughes Air West Flight 706 prepares for takeoff. There are 44 passengers on board. Welcome aboard, folks. We'll be getting underway any minute now. Captain left. Theodore Nikolai right. is in command today. Roger, 24 left. Climb heading 250. First Officer Price Bruner is also highly experienced. Runway's clear. Throttles are all yours. At 6.02 p.m., the Hughes Air West flight lifts off from L.A. 372 miles from Los Angeles at an air base in Nevada. Marine pilot James Richard Phillips and radar intercept officer Christopher Sheese is one of a group of fighters that's been practicing air intercepts over the western United States. And the F-4's high altitude oxygen system was leaking. So there's no way to fix it at this base. And the mechanics in Nevada couldn't fix it. Sir, it's the 10th Yes, sir, we'll do. Yeah, they still want us to head back to El Toro. To avoid using the broken oxygen system. Just keep it nice and low. They've been ordered to fly at low altitude. At 5.15 PM, the F-4 takes off. Pilot Rick Phillips cruises lower than he ordinarily would. 
If it weren't for the oxygen problem, he could fly much higher and clear of commercial traffic leaving Los Angeles. At around 6 p.m., the pilot needs to climb to avoid the mountains ahead and get above a layer of haze. Copy, Rick. Climb to 15,000. There's a basic concept in aviation called see and avoid. It's every pilot's job to watch out for other planes. Investigators wonder why the pilots of the DC-9 did not take any action to avoid the disaster. It's coming in at 420 knots from the north, slightly east. The DC-9 is coming in at 320 knots from the southwest. OK, 040, direct attack. What's the rate of closure? In the seconds before the crash, radar operator Sheets has his head down checking his scope. Pilot Phillips is likely checking instruments. At 15 seconds, the F-4 is one-tenth of an inch big in the window, tiny. 10 seconds, three-tenths of an inch. Still tiny, but maybe now we can see it. Five seconds, the entire window's filled. Just another hazy day. Watch it. None of the pilots that day had enough time to see the other plane in their path. With the plane now less than five miles from the runway, a controller in the airport's tower takes over to guide the flight in for landing. Lindbergh, PSA 182, downwind. 182, roger. Within the airport traffic area, which is that five mile radius, the airplanes coming into the airport to land and take off are controlled by that controller. The tower controller is juggling several planes in addition to the PSA 727. PSA 182, traffic 12 o'clock, one mile, a Cessna. Because if there's only one runway at Lindbergh, uh, it requires some air traffic control spacing because of the difference in the speeds of the aircraft. PSA 182. Cleared to land. 182 is cleared to land. The jets have quite a significantly faster approach speed than the Cessna, so you have to give them more spacing. It's now 9 AM. Many passengers on flight 182 are planning to put in a full day's work in San Diego. Gear down. Minutes from landing, pilot Bob Fox spots a distant plane. There's one underneath. I was looking at that inbound over there. Ah. Easy, baby, easy, baby. A professional photographer happens to spot flight 182 in flames. Hey, what do we got here? It's bad. Huh? We're hit, man. We're hit. Tower. We're going down. This is PSA. OK. We'll call the equipment for you. The approach controller's radar reveals that the 727 has collided with the Cessna. Jesus Christ. It's an aluminum shower. To have two aircraft under your control collide is the worst nightmare, I think, for any controller. I don't think anything else could be that bad. This is it, baby. Break yourself. Ma, I love you. just went right in and just the burst of flames. It was just incredible. And my hair stood up. 
on the back of my head when I learned that this crash had occurred. This huge mushroom cloud of smoke and fire was seen by thousands of people. Two planes have collided and fallen from the sky over San Diego. The city is in shock. But the full scope of the tragedy is only beginning to emerge.